Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Security Space Association's first Legacy Series presentation, looking back on the early days of the GPS program. You're in for a treat to hear from some of the leaders who were actually there during those critical birthing years of the program, dating back to the 1960s, from technology to design to development and launch, and to include hearing from the proclaimed father of GPS himself. Moderating this esteemed panel is another lifelong seasoned space professional to include many years in GPS, that being retired Air Force Lieutenant General Larry James, serving as the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's Deputy Director since 2013. On behalf of the NSSA, thank you, Larry and panel members, for taking the time to sit down and reflect back on the origins of this marvelous program that today has exceeded the, even the most dramatic expectations you had back then. And finally, to our viewers, today's presentation on GPS's early days is only chapter one, as there will be more in the future on this program and on other national security space programs. And so with that, Larry, my friend, over to you and your esteemed panel. Steve, thank you. Uh, it certainly is an honor for me to be a part of this panel, uh, to be a part of this really historic group that set the stage for GPS uh, as we go back and look at its beginnings. Uh, you know, you talk to people today and they don't necessarily even understand where they're getting that lovely signal in their car or on their phone. And yet uh, these are the men who actually brought it to birth and made it happen and proved that it could work. So it is an incredible opportunity to have them all together here today. And I'm very honored to be a part of this panel. I first touched GPS back in 1983 uh, ultimately in the, jet, in the uh, Joint Program Office there at the Space and Missile Systems Center in Los Angeles, uh, and really have had a history of G with GPS uh, really throughout the decades since then. But these men that we we're going to hear from today, they really were the folks who brought this system to fruition and what has really become a worldwide utility that we all use almost every minute of every day in our, in our daily lives. So with that, let's, let me give a brief introduction to the panel members. I will give a more in-depth introduction as we hear from each one of them, but uh, we'll hear first from uh, Peter Wilhelm, uh, a longtime uh, 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 operator at the Naval Research Lab, and uh, I'll get more into depth into his uh, background and history when he speaks. Uh, after him, we'll hear from Brad Parkinson, who really uh, gave birth to the GPS program as we know it today, the father of GPS, well-recognized throughout the community, uh, retired Colonel from the U.S. Air Force. Uh, after Brad, we'll hear from a retired Colonel Gaylord Green. Again, a long history with, with GPS as a, as a junior officer as well as a senior officer, ultimately directing the, jet, uh, the Joint Program Office. And finally, we'll hear from Ed Lassiter, who uh, came to the Joint Program Office and really brought some operational and acquisition perspectives that were needed at the time. Uh, aerospace Corporate Vice President, and a key member of really moving GPS forward at a critical time. So that's our panel here today, uh, truly a great team of men who uh, lived through the history of GPS and really brought GPS to us as we know it today. And what I'm gonna have each panel member do is just really spend about 10 or 15 minutes uh, reflecting on the time that they were working with the early days of GPS, what that was like, the challenges they faced, the hurdles they had to overcome, and really uh, how they drove GPS forward. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Pete. Again, as I said, Pete uh, has his uh, BS in electrical engineering from Purdue University. He has spent some time in industry, and then he went to the Naval Research Lab uh, back in uh, 1959 and spent all of his career after that at the Naval Research Lab, where for those of you who don't know, they were really the first folks thinking about uh, atomic clocks in space and timing, and they had timation satellites and those sorts of things. But a lot of history that came out of the Naval Research Lab that ultimately formed a lot of the basis for GPS. So Pete, I'll turn it over to you to just uh, give us some of your recollections and reflections on those times and really that fundamental development of the technologies and capabilities that gave us GPS as we know it today. So Pete, over to you. Okay. Well, let's see. It, uh started in 1964 when Roger Easton um, told me about a briefing he had recently gotten on the advances that were being made in atomic clocks. And what Roger really wanted to do 
was put an atomic clock in the satellite. And he talked to me about what later he described as passive ranging. And that is so fundamental to GPS, it's, it's hard to overemphasize it. But I understood where the state of the art was back then. And I said to Roger that, my God, it, it's, our clocks aren't nearly good enough to do what you're talking about. And he said, I know they've got to be improved uh, two or three orders of magnitude. And, uh, but he said, that's just an engineering problem. And, uh, you know, I, I thought, boy, it's going to take an awful long time for this to ever happen if it, if it ever does. And uh, turns out, really, both of us were right. It did take a long time, but Roger was correct. Uh, and uh, it took us 10 years to put up the first atomic clock. And three years after that, we put up a better clock. And uh, I guess the other thing that uh, Roger talked about was the need to have more than one satellite uh, because you've got, uh, I guess mathematicians call it a simultaneous solution of equations. You've, if you've got three or four unknowns like latitude, longitude, altitude of your position and time, uh, time difference between you and the master clock, um, those are four unknowns. So you need, in general, you need four satellites to uh, range on simultaneously and, and then you can solve the equations. Uh, so it's more than just a single satellite, it's really a constellation. And uh, I guess the other thing that Roger was a real master at was uh, doing meaningful demonstrations to people that had the ability to uh, support and fund what it was gonna to take to do this. And the first experiment that he demoed was really a funny one. He took two traveling atomic clocks and he had one there at the laboratory in Washington along I-295. The other one he put in the backseat of a Cadillac convertible and um, he had the guy drive past the lab and he demonstrated this to his NAVAIR sponsor. And you could see the range, instantaneous range between the vehicle, the uh, convertible and the lab. And that was good enough for them to approve a small budget, $35,000 to get started on Roger's idea of eventually putting this in a satellite. And uh, the satellite that we launched was uh, called Timation One. And uh, following that, uh, particularly uh, John Foster was very impressed with the fundamental capability that was being demonstrated to him. And uh, he set up, um, through the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, told them to produce some guidelines for what, what is the military really going to want from this sort of a system. So they call them guidelines. They were not hard specs, but they were guidelines to follow. And then Johnny Foster also set up a group called the NAVSEG, Navigation, I forget what the SEG part stood for, but uh, they were uh, a continuing group. They, you know, met periodically to keep track of, you know, how things were going. Were they, were we making progress, heading in the right direction? And I think that was also a valuable lesson. And, and having an organization like that, which uh, can keep track of these technical issues, which are, which are fairly complex, um, was very helpful. Um, let's see, following that, we had another opportunity to improve the clocks for our second Timation satellite. This one was a little bit bigger, still on the after act, and still in low Earth orbit, and still a uh, quartz clock. It was not yet an atomic clock. 
but it was better than the first one. And let, let's see, the, uh, let me give you some numbers here. The technical capability demonstrated by the first satellite was about 2,400 feet uh, geolocation accuracy. The second one dropped it by a factor of 10 down to about 240 feet. And then uh, later came the first atomic clock and that uh, brought the accuracy down to about 60 feet. And the last one, which was a better clock, a cesium clock, brought it down to about 16 feet, which exceeded the requirement at the time, which was 25 feet. So if, if you were below 25 feet of accuracy, um, you met, you, you exceeded the spec. Um, the, uh, the other thing was the, in 1969, uh, there was an ESCON conference and the competing ideas for how to go about doing a navigation system were all briefed at this conference. And there were three at the beginning. One was uh, transit, um, advanced transit um, expanded to meet the new requirements. The other one was the Air Force 621B program, which was a regional uh, system. There were four regions around the earth, 90 degrees apart, that would cover uh, most of the globe. Uh, and then there was the Navy's 12-hour uh, orbits at about 62 degrees. Um, but very circular. Uh, and the circular orbit was, was really important um, because if you didn't use a circular orbit, then you had to deal with basically Einstein's uh, relativity problem, which would have complicated um, and, and limited the accuracy that you could achieve if you didn't in some way compensate for that. If you put it in a circular orbit, uh, the shift in the frequency was basically constant. So it was a bias, it was an offset and easy to correct for. So the key was the orbit was very important. And also with a, the orbit, you had to have um, something that was very predictable because just like the clock, um, an equally important error is an error in your ephemeris of the satellite. If you don't know exactly where the satellite is, then everything's off. So they're both very important. And that was the key to the Navy's proposal. I think that, that really gives us a good summary. Uh, I think we'll uh, wrap up there with the, the Navy component to the NRL component. Uh, as a, uh, as a young captain who uh, helped launch uh, Navstar 9, 10, and 11 on the Atlas, uh, uh, thank you for getting an Atlas that really worked uh, after Navstar 7, of course. Uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of great history there and a lot of great uh, uh, understanding of atomic clocks and the requirement there and the, all the things that you talked about. But I know Brad will amplify on that. So uh, uh, let's move to Brad. and. Uh, Again, just a, a more in-depth introduction. Uh, Brad went to the Naval Academy. He got his uh, master's at MIT and PhD at Stanford. Uh, he's currently a recalled emeritus professor at Stanford. So a long association with Stanford uh, after his uh, work in the Air Force and developing GPS. But Brad really is known as the kind of the chief architect of the GPS program as we know it today, uh, as the Air Force moved forward in this joint program office and developed that. Uh, he's got multiple awards, uh, IEEE Fellow and Stanford Engineering Hero. And, uh, you know, he has just really set the stage and the standard for navigation from space. So Brad, uh, certainly you bring an incredible amount of history to this and you lived through it. Uh, you kept it alive. So uh, we love to just hear from you and your perspective. Well, uh, thank you for that, Larry. Uh, yeah, I, I, in November of 1972, I was happy as a clam. I was running an engineering 
a large engineering program for the Air Force called ABRIS. Don't have to get into that, but I got called in General Schultz's office, a three-star general, and he, uh, he suggested he wanted to move me. I already had a hint that this might happen. I had a background in inertial navigation. Uh, I had the full uh, Kool-Aid from Dr. Draper. I understood the self-contained. I was all uh, for that and somewhat uh, skeptical about radio navigation. And I had a background in space mechanics and all this sort of thing. So the fit was pretty good. And uh, he finally uh, said, uh, well, well, what do you think? Should I transfer you? And I said, well, you're gonna make me in charge. And he said, well, I can't promise that. And I said, then I don't wanna go. <laughs> and a three-star general is not used to seeing a brand new Colonel talking to him like that. And uh, he nodded, but didn't say anything. And uh, as I stepped out of his office, I think it took him about five nanoseconds to call personnel and says, transfer the young Colonel. And so the first thing I did, which I thought was absolutely brilliant, was worry that, uh, I'd, I'd studied the program a little bit, 621B at the time. And uh, the first thing I did is pick up the phone and call someone who already worked for me. And his name was Major Gaylord Green because he was a very brilliant young officer and he and I had been students together at Stanford, he getting his master's and I getting a PhD. And uh, I knew him quite well. And, and during the brief period that I was at Abreeze, uh, he had demonstrated First of all, more than anything else, Gaylord is outstanding at synthesis. He can conceive things that I think uh, were brilliant. And he, would, he, he was an unabashed uh, user of other ideas, melding them together, and, and, uh, and that was an important capability. But at any rate, in November of 1972, I was suddenly stuck with a huge problem. First of all, we were in a heck of a food fight with the Navy, and there were <clears throat> a lot of differences. I am reminded as I hear my friend Pete, who I greatly admire, I am reminded of the story of the elephant in which the blind man walk up to the elephant and all have a slightly different view of what that elephant is all about in terms of the guy grabs a tail and says it feels like a rope and somebody grabs the, uh, the uh, leg and says, no, it's like a tree and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, just as one might expect, as old memories fade and et cetera, uh, there are a few of Pete's details that I would modulate slightly. But nonetheless, I want you to know if I do that, it is great respect for both NRL and for Pete, who I personally think is one of the great resources that we had during the, the time of the Cold War. Well. I was suddenly faced with a leadership challenge and the leadership challenge to me had three aspects and I'm gonna delve into just one of them later, but let me just say what they are. The first was, if we were gonna do anything, we had to get the technical details right. And the system I had inherited, I had some problems with, but I brought it forward and um, with a lot of help from a lot of people, uh, we, uh, well, <laughs> We had what we call Black Thursday in August of 1973, in which the DSARC, the great decision-making body chaired by Mel Curry, uh, did thumbs down. I was in front of a bunch of admirals and senior officials, and they voted me out of office, so to speak. And I thought, well, there goes a nice career. And But Mel Curry, who, be, who was an absolute mentor to GPS, he inherited Johnny Foster, who I also knew, but by that time, the administrations had changed. And uh, so Mel Curry, Dr. Mel Curry uh, said, Brad, I wanna see you in my office. And I thought, well, I'll get dressed down. And so I went into his office and it was just the opposite. He said, listen, I think you're gonna do a great job, but you've got to incorporate a wider view of what we ought to do. And at the time, uh, the Air Force already understood the need for atomic clocks in space. And back in 1965, there had been a study advocating we pursue such a program. But bless his heart, uh, Roger Easton uh, was the guy who actually was pursuing it. And uh, it, it was kind of a desperate quest because really stable clocks, atomic clocks were laboratory devices. So. Uh, I'll say a little more about that in a minute if uh, people can tolerate it. But at any rate, uh, the, the first 
huge challenge was to get all these technical details right. And after being canceled in August, Mal Curry said, come back to us, bring us a, uh, your view of what this design ought to be, and we will see if we can't approve it. And so I called a meeting in the Pentagon, a famous Lonely Halls meeting. <clears throat> Gaylord was there, one of the mainstays. Steve Gilbert was there. Bill Houston was there. There were a bunch of, uh, to me, real he heroes of GPS. And we took all the knowledge that we had and accumulated it and uh, came up with what amounts to GPS today. I, I know of no major changes in the concept that we advocated. And I'll say a little more about where my view is, where some of that came from. But nonetheless, I had to get the technical details right. So that was the first management challenge. The second was, as soon as you were going to try to do this, we did eventually, we, got, we came back in December, gained approval, and we were off and running. But if you're going to do this, there were three major pieces, and we added a fourth. There was the space, there was the control system, there was the user equipment. But there was a fourth piece that was equally complex, and although some would say it was anticlimactic, that was a test program. And we had a massive test program, and we had to show every admiral and general what this would do, or at least that was what I thought we had to do. So we had to merge these complex interactions, and I darn near got fired by General Schultz, who I think liked me, more or less. But uh, I explained that we, the Air Force, this group of Air Force officers and the Aerospace Corporation supporting us, we were going to integrate this. We were going to put it all together because Schultz's idea was we would hire an integrating contractor. We didn't do that. And the consequence of that, in my opinion, was success because had we done that, my guess is we would be so burdened with bureaucracy and trying to teach uh, yet another contractor what this was all about. I don't think the, the program would ever have worked. So that gets me back to what the underlying situation was. Not only was I able to get Gaylord to come, I scanned the Air Force and frankly, I, I got the cream of technical and management excellence in the young field grade, junior grade officers that we had. And they carried an enormous burden. The Aerospace Corporation had some people that were absolutely awesome, uh, not a large cadre, uh, the president of aerospace, one of our strong supporters, wanted me to expand that to 100 aerospace people. And I told him, no, that isn't what we're doing. That is not what we're all about. We're about a lean, mean organization. So managing those complex interactions was the second main leadership challenge. The third sort of to an engineer comes from left field. Third and, and the last engineer, uh, challenge I would like to mention is to fight a sustained political battle. Because it was clear from the beginning, the Air Force simply didn't want this. They uh, would rather have some more airplanes. They would rather do almost anything than buy something the space cadets were offering. And as a result, were it not for the defense of our program by Mal Curry, later Pete Aldridge, some of the other key civilians in DOD, this would have gone down the tubes. There were Air Force supporters, Air Force General Officer supporters, but not in near enough numbers or with near enough clout to cause this, this GPS idea to actually prosper. So uh, let me go back and say a few words about GPS, uh, the technical details and what the challenges were. We selected the idea of four satellites simultaneously ranging to them, which gave three-dimensional position and very precise time. That was one of the highlighted alternatives in a very fundamental system engineering study done by aerospace at the behest of the Air Force in 1964 to 66. And I still have the summary documents from that. The concept that Roger Easton was advocating for, for some constrained reasons, was basically a ranging between two synchronized atomic clocks. And he described that 
in the patent that he wrote and was issued in 1974. Uh, yeah, Nicky wrote it up in 72. But the point was, we knew that if you're going to demonstrate it to the Air Force, it had to be three-dimensional. You had to show you could do blind bombing. You had to show the utility. So the concept in our thinking came from that study and subsequent evolutions of it. Incidentally, that study did call for atomic clocks in space, and it also called for a worldwide system. The second major innovation, Pete has already touched on it, was the signal structure. The PRN code, the pseudo-random code, is actually only 1% of ambient noise as you look across the spectrum. It is a teeny little signal. And there was extreme doubt that we could range to it, that we could use it to do this. And we proceeded, we had a bunch of help from aerospace, from Magnavox, from uh, Jim Spilker. Uh, he wasn't at Stanford Telecon to begin with, but he later formed his own company. And that signal structure, muted, thank you. We decided that had to be uh, demonstrated and 621B by 1971 was already doing a four transmitter demonstration in the desert. Analysis carried forward. It took us uh, over a year to do the decent analysis. But uh, again, I'll mention another name, Bill Fees, very honored technical engineer from aerospace, did that analysis and was able to demonstrate before I got the final decision of okay that we could do five to 10 meters in three dimensions. And he, he did it with actual data, actual hardware. That was extremely important. Of course, the third technical development was space-borne atomic clocks. And I've uh, a tip of the hat to NRL. They work very, very hard. Um, I, would not, I would not describe what they orbited as uh, space-qualified clocks because on uh, our first launch of the real operational GPS satellites, the clock failed in, I think, 24 hours, their CCM clock. Fortunately, in parallel, we had set up a development of a rubidium clock that was space hardened. It demonstrated that hardening by lasting in life long enough to do our tests. So the basic idea of the test was put up four satellites, uh, we had hoped to use uh, the NRL satellite as well, but for some technical reasons, we weren't able to do that, but the four satellites were enough. And we carried out an extensive test program with, with many, many uh, pieces of user equipment. And that convinced some, and it didn't convince the rest of them. The US Air Force still didn't particularly want to do this. Um, a fourth thing that was very important is long live satellites. We demonstrated that with a, uh, our first phase one satellites lasted an average, I think of over nine years. And uh, that is a great tribute to attention to detail, a, a, a great parts program and rigorous testing. Test it as you fly it. And if it breaks, get down to the root cause. And that's what we did. And uh, credit to Rockwell International, Dick Schwartz, Hugo Fruhoff, some of those engineers. The last thing I'd like to just touch on is a little bit of serendipity. And uh, Gaylord might disagree that it was serendipity. I think all of us felt that the digital signal and digital signal processing was the wave of the future. But candidly, it was still cumbersome because although integrated circuits had started to come into being, they weren't, we didn't use them. We used discrete components. So a five channel receiver had five racks, one for each channel. And uh, our man pack weighed 40 pounds plus batteries, as I recall. Yeah, and it was only single channel. It had to sit there and listen to this satellite and then listen to that satellite and move around. So the, the point is that we caught the beginning of a massive wave. And today, a uh, GPS slash GLONASS slash Galileo slash Beidou receiver goes into your cell phone, 
built by Qualcomm, it can probably receive 60 channels simultaneously from four different, plus the FAA's WAS signal, and it costs $2. And I had put a goal of our program office as you entered our, our uh, area. The first goal was drop five bombs in the same hole. And that meant you had to demonstrate accuracy. And the second goal on that sign was, and we have to build a cheap set that works. Well, cheap then, I was asked naturally by general officers who get curious about these things. Um, I, uh, it cheap to, to us then was $10,000 in production. Now, I suspect the man packs were probably marginal costs of over 100,000 each. I don't uh, know. If they were just 50,000, Brad. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. At any rate, the point is that they were single channel. Now we have 60 channels in a, a, a cell phone ship that uses very few watts and uh, produces what it does, as you can see. Well, I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned, Larry, uh, in, in what we did, some carryovers. Um, but I, I, to me, the biggest lesson, and, and I, I, sent, I hope the Air Force is heading this way, the Space Force, uh, is that people is what made the difference. It was the people that made the difference. It was people like Gaylord and, and his colleagues, many of whom have died now. It's people like Ed Lassiter and his team at, at Aerospace. It was those people with great technical understanding, but something else. They had enormous motivation. They did not want to fail. And they put in whatever hours were required. The satellite system that Gaylord started to procure, we actually launched, I think in 44 months from a dead start, never having a prototype, for a full GPS satellite. We launched it in 44 months and the darn thing worked. And I think that's a tribute to a lot of people, but it wasn't just that. The support was there, the control system worked, the user equipment worked, and it was a no excuse environment. And I think the commitment was fundamental to the people that we had. So more than anything else, my tribute is to the people who actually made it happen. And if you've ever heard my presentations about the history, it goes on and on about people. My wife wonders what on earth I'm, I'm doing in terms of uh, showing all the pictures. Well, a lot of them are dead. Most of them will be forgotten, including me, but by golly, they were the ones that ha made it happen. Thanks. Brad, uh, thank you, and uh, you're exactly right. Uh, nothing happens without leadership and without people. So uh, we may delve into that a little deeper as we get into our discussion. Uh, well, again, welcome back, and uh, we'll continue with our panel members here today. Uh, next up will be uh, retired Colonel Gaylord Green. Uh, Gaylord Green uh, got his uh, BS uh, from the Air Force Academy in Engineering Science. As Brad uh, indicated, they were both at Stanford together where uh, Gaylord got his Master of Science in uh, Aero Astro. And then had a variety of assignments uh, throughout the space world in the Air Force uh, at SAMSO, worked on missiles, uh, worked in plans, uh, technology and Avery's that Brad happened to mention. Uh, and of course, in GPS uh, twice under Brad. And then uh, I uh, first met Gaylord when he was the program director of the Joint Program Office and I was a young captain. And uh, he certainly was my mentor as, uh, as I moved forward in my Air Force career. And in, uh, in retirement, he's been up at Stanford working at uh, the Einstein physics program. Uh, so just an incredible career, but as uh, Brad mentioned, kind of one of the brains behind uh, the original GPS and getting that going. So Gaylord, we'd love to hear your perspective as, uh, as a young major, uh, kind of taking on this challenge and moving it forward. Sure. Uh, as Brad said, as he headed back to Washington, I headed to Montana on leave. And and I just got up there and I got this call, will you please return? <laughs> and uh, anyway, I came back and, and so uh, uh, seeing how it got rejected, I wanted to put together the best of the Navy and the best of the Air Force and put together. So I went and visited Roger and Roger sort of had a, a system that I, I'll call good for 
for the submarines. It was a, a S, SLBM update, uh, so they wouldn't be vulnerable like they were with the with the transit updates that they got. The Air Force had a more military system being geared geared for uh, Vietnam, and so they 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 were headed military. The first decision was the orbit, and that was an easy one because circular orbits uh, have a big advantage over elliptical orbits, and uh, particularly in power. Basically, with a circular orbit, you can go at any altitude, and your power on the satellite is the same. The only difference is your antenna. As long as you stay Earth coverage, uh, it, Earth shrinks like R squared, uh, loss goes like R squared. And so the power is constant in the satellite and all you're adjusting is the antenna. And so we went with a, 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 a circular orbit. Uh, <clears throat> the user equipment guys always wanted more power, which was a problem on the satellite. The 3dB uh, required a, a sizable increase in the, in the, in the satellite size. And, and Brad did a great job of selling the program, but he forgot to get the money. And we, we didn't have a whole lot of money to carry, carry this off. And so <clears throat> what we did uh, do is uh, do everything there uh, to try and, uh, and minimize the cost. One of the things is the user equipment uh, wanted more power. And so we specified power on the ground. We guaranteed power on the ground, wrote the incentives, so power on the ground. And that gave Rockwell a chance to do a unique antenna design with more power in the edge and less in the center where most satellites were more power in the center and less on the edge. The next thing I'll, I'll say is analog. Gaylord, Gaylord, I thought you were gonna talk about that under the table loan you got from Abreys to keep this oh, thing going. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Brad, uh, I, being my boss, he and my uh, this major I worked for at the time, who had been in plans, uh, they decided I should. Uh, we needed to get an independent study, and I had this guy who had worked for me before, Isaac Newton Durbro, who I thought would be perfect to to do the analysis that we needed. And uh, and uh, Brad took off to school there, and and. Uh, so I went back to, uh, to Abreys uh, requesting a loan because plants didn't have any money. So I requested a loan and uh, told them I'd like to borrow basically one man year. And so I said, we may not be able to pay you back. So don't, don't expect to get paid back. And they agreed to loan me the money for one man year. I put it on a contract that I used to have because uh, Isaac Newton Durbro used to work for me. And I came back and Brad was still gone. I was trying to figure out how to tell the major uh, what I had done. And, uh, and one day he poked his head in the office. He says, I'm going to staff meeting. Do you have anything to report? And I said, yeah, that study you wanted? Tell him it's on contract. And he said, but we didn't have any money. I says, I know, I borrowed it. But we might not be able to pay it back. I said, I know, I told him. He said, but we didn't have any authority. I said, well, I know, I borrowed that too. <laughs> and... And he went uh, down the hall talking to himself. <laughs> but anyway, that turned out to be a good, a good thing later on. But anyway, uh, the Navy had an analog system, uh, side tone ranging, uh, and uh, the Air Force had a digital system, PRN, that uh, Pete talked about. And, uh, and I felt that the uh, analog system, the side tone ranging, did not have enough military utility. So we went with that. The Air Force had L-band and had two frequencies already approved. Uh, Roger had UHF, which was a lower frequency and just a, a, and didn't have a, an approval process. He could use it in an R&D sense. And so that one was easy too. We went with L-band at two frequency. Uh, TDMA versus CDMA, uh, time division multiple access and code division mobile access. And that one uh, was, uh, I felt that the satellite would be better served with the code division mobile access rather than a pulsed sort of a thing that uh, would be harder on lifetime. And it was important to have a long life satellite. 
uh, <clears throat> the rubidium clock, uh, you know, Roger uh, flew the rubidium clock, but it, it didn't last long enough to really even test it on the uh, NTS-2. And Rockwell picked up uh, the rubidium and uh, did the engineering to give it a long lifetime sort of a thing. And uh, basically, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, and uh, like Brad said, it took a lot of energy. And, uh, and uh, we had a lot of help from <laughs> aerospace. Uh, uh, Bill Shang and Irv Rosetnik, uh, Irv the dancing, he was the dancing bear and I was the teddy bear, so. Anyway, that's, that's my short story on the, on the lead-in. All right. Well, you mentioned aerospace, and I think uh, what better time to segue to uh, Ed Lasseter. Uh, Ed is just a stalwart of the Aerospace Corporation. He got his bachelor's at University of Cup, uh, Kentucky in uh, double E, master's at MIT. Uh, also, I went to UCLA for another master's of engineering. Uh, he was an executive vice president of aerospace, but he basically came over from the classified side to bring some uh, I would say operational focus and acquisition focus to the program office. So Ed, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit of that story as you uh, entered into the joint program office world. Well, thank you, Larry. And uh, I, I do need to say that um, I did have my head down uh, in another world uh, while all these uh, pioneers really of uh, bringing the GPS architecture and system engineering trade-offs and all kinds of technology that my earlier colleagues at Aerospace, uh, Woodford and Nakamura, and working in the plans and technology group and supporting that group in the Air Force at SMC had done all these 621B studies and done uh, experiments and technology and great analysis and trade-offs I came late to the party and that all groundwork had been done. And uh, even uh, the Lonely Halls meeting when the seven officers and three aerospace guys got together, I, I missed all of that. Uh, and the reason I missed it was uh, I was over in the NRO special projects area and for a decade before GPS, I had been the program director of what was really turned out to be one of our major national security programs. Uh, but it, like GPS, started as a high tech, cutting edge tech thing that was really an experiment that a lot of people thought had no chance of working and behold, it worked. And uh, so I had my head down as uh, in 10 years of uh, being a program director of that program. So, I worked with a lot of smart guys and a lot of dedicated guys in the NRO. And I'm really grateful for that because the one thing I took away from the, all that early years and, and Brad even mentioned a couple of names that were really helpful to GPS as we were trying to move it through the defense department was uh, General Lou Allen who had his PhD degree and General Hank Stelling who was on the RDS staff in, um, in the Pentagon. And both of those were friends of GPS when they needed a friend. And uh, I, I got to work with a lot of really, really outstanding officers and uh, people in the NRO. So I came late to the party. Um, all the architecture had been settled. The technologies had been studied and analyzed. Um, and the contracts were actually awarded by the time I got to GPS. <clears throat> so I kind of made my own assessment and said, well, the one thing that's got to happen here, and Brad alluded to it, is uh, there's got to be four satellites launched by 1978, and they all got to work. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so I intentionally went back to uh, some people that I'd met in, in the NRO days and, um, and recruited several of them who had, a, I thought, the best background 
that I could get and uh, what it took to uh, launch, to, I'm gonna say, develop, acquire, launch and operate uh, good satellites on orbit. And one of them was Irv Rezepnik, who had worked in the imagery side of the house. The and had, Bear, he taught me almost everything I knew about uh, long life satellites there. <laughs> he was great. Well, and, and uh, I, I know that uh, you, we started off a little rocky in terms of, of uh, both Irv and myself but with, the, with that. But I think, you know, Irv was all about mission first. And Brad, you alluded to this in the last part of your talk, and I thought it's really appropriate. The thing that really strikes me is making a difference. So when I showed up at, at GPS, uh, I met this extraordinary, very talented, uh, educationally superior and uh, technology savvy a uh, group of officers, at least seven of them had their PhD and, and they were just brilliant. And um, so that was uh, quite a quite a awakening for me. I met lots of good, smart people in the NRO, but these guys were exceptional. And the other thing is um, they were as mission minded and put the mission first. And Brad mentioned this um, and um, they were dedicated. And so all of that was really a terrific experience on my part. But <clears throat> like Brad said, I think uh, we had to earn our way into the program with some credibility. So I, I recruited uh, three directors, four directors really for uh, the leadership in aerospace between 74 and 80. And uh, the satellite guy was uh, Irv Rezepnik, who worked with Gaylord a lot and Gaylord's successor. Uh, the software guy was a guy named Pete Swanson, who had supported a lot of the software development for the NRO programs. And the third one was Dick Leslie, who had worked on a lot of payload uh, R&D projects uh, and had been responsible for the development and, uh, and testing of those. And the last one was Gene Farr. And so I would say that team brought a lot of experience on how to get good hardware um, acquired and tested and made ready for space. And as Brad mentioned, every test anomaly had to be chased down and uh, explain why and how. And I think uh, that that was, a, that was what primarily we added to the team was bringing some experience and me a decade of experience in uh, running a program that was very similar but different application of technology uh, for the NRO. And so that was one of the things I think it was important, but it was just really a pleasure working with uh, all of the guys in, in the JPO, who all of them were dedicated and mission-minded from the background I'd come from in the NRO. And one of those things was factory to pad. I don't know, does that ring any bell, <laughs> Gaylord? It does. <laughs> yeah, well, that's one of the things that we learned in, uh, you know, three generations of MS satellites, uh, Corona, Gambit, and Hexacon. They must have had over 200 launches in 10 years. And uh, they had to launch one after the other. And they had to have good hardware and it had to work. So we just evolved by making mistakes, but we evolved to this concept. You really have got to do good parts, S parts. And by the way, I think the NRO funded a lot of these uh, uh, chip lines that all we got our parts from were some of those S parts who had been funded essentially and established by uh, special projects. And they benefited all of the space programs. But you start off with good parts, you do good uh, design with margins, and then you test it and you chase every discrepancy. And then when you get done with that, you, you come and do this, you put it all together as a system 
and you do the same thing in the factory. And when you get done with that, then you button it up and you don't let anybody touch it if you can until you launch it. That's factory to pad. <laughs> let, and let, so, let, yeah, let, let me, if I could, uh, let me supplement what you just said because that led to a massive confrontation. Uh, the concept that Ed is describing is one in which you run it through all of its, the, the qual vehicle goes through its deal and then the acceptance on the individual thing you're trying to launch does that all at the factory. And then you ship it, you bolt it on the top of this thing, you run your uh, health checks, et cetera, but you don't go through a full acceptance test the second time at Vandenberg. And unfortunately, at that point, uh, the Air Force's tradition was you brought it there and they had a whole test wing who was dedicated to tearing back into your satellite. And I ended up in a, a massive confrontation with a full, another full colonel down there. We ended up going up to the three star, the two of us. And my statement was, he's not touching my satellite. He isn't coming anywhere near it. <laughs> Yeah. And, 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 and this guy said, no, the, the tradition and the documents, and they all say we're supposed to do this. I said, I don't care what that says. You're not touching my satellite. <laughs> and Schultz listened and watched these two colonels arguing vehemently in front of him. And finally, he says, Brad, you're the program director. You're responsible. We're doing it your way. And that's, that's how that decision got made. And it was it was a knockdown, drag out battle. But first of all, it would have delayed things. And secondly, you know, dang well, what would have happened? They would have discovered some anomalies that because they didn't understand them, the whole thing would be screeching to a halt. And, That's exactly uh, right. <laughs> oh, I, I totally subscribe to this. And uh, you were the one that pointed out that there was this, this little digression that Vandenberg liked to shove into the queue. <laughs> And uh, I said, no way, no way. If the guy's got a screwdriver and he can get up in orbit and fix my satellite, that's one thing. But no, 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 he's not fixing it sitting there at Vandenberg. No way. And I think uh, by and large, it's a credit to uh, the people at Rockwell. It's a credit to aerospace. It's a credit to the way Gaylord set this program, the space side of it up. That all of this uh, this came together, and and uh, I don't think we I don't think we had any significant satellite problems. No, uh, to my knowledge, no. I, it, it, it 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 by and large the darn things just worked. Well, they uh, did. I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. Ed. I didn't mean no, to. No, no, no. All, all those were good words, and and for the exactly the right reason because. Uh, uh, in, in special projects, uh, I give all credit to the leadership there when I was a young guy learning the trade. Um, they learned factory to pad the hard way. And, uh, and, but, but that's what they went with. And um, it, it has served well, I think, in, in doing your best uh, at the lowest levels, the design, the parts, the black boxes, and you get all of that straight, then, then do good thorough system testing at the systems level in the factory, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. So I gotta give a lot of credit to Rockwell because I think uh, they didn't start off that way. And Dick Schwartz was very good to see. And, and I think in the end, uh, Dick became uh, Irv Rezepnik's uh, a colleague in this and, uh, and Gaylord's. I think all three of them really worked well together for that space segment. And I do got to give it a lot of credit for the, the aerospace uh, labs and, um, and, and the functional groups and the engineering group because uh, they had had a lot of experience in software development and uh, in orbit uh, determination. And uh, because from their early days of the image satellites, they had to know where they had to load up um, oh, all of the command structure that was going to happen over denied territories, so they had to know where that those commands took place. So they had to know where the, the satellite was going to be, and they had to predict ahead. And so they had already done all the Kalman filtering uh, uh, studies, and and that was underway. And and a lot of that talent and uh, experience was brought to bear on uh, GPS, which was 
which I think contributed to all of that. So the Rockwell guys, Dick Schwartz, uh, uh, they, they were really flexible in adopting the best practices, I think. I don't know, Gaylord, would you wanna add something? <laughs> no, I, I, I agree. Uh, basically, we, you know, we set up the meeting once a week down at Rockwell. Yep. And, uh, and uh, we worked great. Yeah, it was, and it, and and so that was it. I, I would say another thing, Brad, and uh, that that one of the things I brought over with me was the uh, concept of hardware in the loop testing, and uh, it was a little phrase that we used. But we took took qual black boxes, everything that <clears throat> would affect the mission, and. Uh, put software, real software in the loop and, and ran what if scenarios to make sure that whatever uh, we ran across in orbit that we could quickly do some patching of software, run it through the hardware and know what was gonna happen. Yeah. And it turned out that really happened on our first launch. <laughs> we had a little problem in acquisition. <laughs> And uh, we, we had this, uh, we had already established this laboratory. It didn't cost a lot of MTS, but it costs a little. And uh, we had already practiced that. And so we were able to get uh, some software patches and send them up to, uh, to the uh, network in Sunnyvale. And, uh, and we knew that they worked because we'd already had a chance to check them out in, the, in our laboratory in hardware in the loop software testing. So that was, that was, I think, an important thing too. So <clears throat> what else? Let, 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 me, uh, let, let me just jump in and add something uh, as an accolade to Ed's leadership. And that was, um, he, he succeeded someone who uh, frankly did not work out very well uh, because he didn't, the, the individual he succeeded uh, was, way too abrasive, did not sell his ideas. The, the beauty of Ed's leadership is that at times it was when it had to be, it was quite subtle. He would, uh, <laughs> he would inculcate into my brain certain ideas and uh, with his quiet Kentucky way, convinced me of what, what was the right thing to do. And uh, candidly, he had a, a big piece of of the success, but uh, so many did, but it, it's always fun to, to celebrate. And Ed, you did one heck of a great job, thanks. <laughs> well, thank you, Brad. And you know, I can say, Larry, I don't know what it has to do with the history, but, but all of these guys, uh, we had our differences when I first arrived uh, and we had to earn our uh, trust with uh, what I thought was a brilliant group of uh, leadership in the JPO. But, uh, you know, we turned out to be life friends <laughs> with all of them. And I kept bumping into them all at different points in our careers as we aged gracefully or ungracefully together. And it, it, it was a great experience. And, uh, but it, it was our challenges. And I thought that's primarily what aerospace brought to the table was some uh, with some experience gained uh, in the NRO, and uh, and 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 they were smart enough and wise enough to uh, to take that experience. So it it uh, I I guess I'm going to close with that as what I think are some of our major contributions. I personally left the program in 1980 after uh, they had been approved for full scale development and I think Larry you and Gaylord came back after that again uh, but that's when I left in uh, in 80 but I served with a lot of uh, my colleagues in the JPO and Don Henderson and uh, even uh, Ed Berry and and Brock Strom I met them later on in different programs and we we really had a, a wonderful uh, careers together as we grew up in the space business. Yeah, well, thank you, Ed. I mean, great summary, great lessons. Uh, I will say that, you know, when I was doing the space segment in GPS, uh, Al Briganti and Nikki Nelson, my aerospace uh, leads for the space segment, I still, you know, they were great people who navigated this young captain through uh, the shoals of JPO, JPO 
And uh, I always remember that as a young captain and when Gaylord Green came in, he made the young officers do a special research project and then outbrief him. And it's like, <laughs> wow, I got to brief the colonel. This is pretty scary stuff, you know? So, uh, but he challenged us and uh, I think uh, he had a great team that rose to the challenge. Um, so thank you to the, the, the team here. Uh, just a great session to understand what it really takes to bring an idea and a technology to fruition and turn it into this, as I said, global utility. So uh, great to just hear the, the trials, tribulations, but also the successes and frankly, the lessons and the recommendations. I think this will serve our armed force as well, our space force well, and ultimately our nation well in terms of taking some of these things to heart. So, uh, and I will point out, Brad, uh, we're flying the Qualcomm Snapdragon on our helicopter on Mars. So uh, we did indeed take advantage of that. So uh, uh, excellent, and and uh, of course, JPL is noted for its agility and 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 far out ideas. And I hope you're going to continue to have. The R&D flexibility, as I recall, there was a center director's fund that allowed you to do and prime the pump. And, and to me, that was just just marvelous. And, and that fund maybe should have been expanded, but uh, I hope it's sustained at least. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, this is also going to be viewed by uh, young officers and young engineers who are dealing with challenges today. So as you think back about your experience, uh, what would you say to them today in terms of executing future GPS 4, 5, and 6 or other challenging technology development efforts that will support P&T or other Space Force requirements? Uh, you know, what are the key lessons that you would want to foster for them today so that they are successful? In Space Force doesn't set up a horrendous gauntlet. And it's, it's easy to see where that might happen. Uh, I know when I took the user equipment through to get uh, limited rate production, I had the secretary uh, add up the number of briefings I had to give to the three services. It was 104 briefings to get through from full scale engineering development to limited rate production. And I would hope that somehow when we set up a new space force that has to service the other three forces, that we don't set up a, a gauntlet process that is just too horrendous for any development. And so at least in some sense, I hope they have a technology program of some kind that doesn't require a horrendous approval process for some young officer to come up with a good idea to make happen. Um, I think one of the things that um, leadership really should do is take their staffs and sort of break them up into smaller cells that can deal with the myriad of problems that somebody at Jay Raymond's level will have. But it can't be one big giant group. Ought to assign certain people, all right, you work this problem, you work this problem, and then you get together with the teams periodically to see how it goes and uh, hopefully, you know, Jay worked at the lab for a couple of years, putting uh, um, satellites together. Um, and I think he's probably saw that at the lab. That's how we did it. We had small focused teams that worked a particular problem. And then management can sort of sit back and say, yeah, that's important. We're going to really push that. Because at some point you do have to prioritize. You can't deal with every damn problem. And, uh, but I, that's the way I would uh, recommend uh, they try and do it. And obviously, as we've said time and again on this thing, it all comes down to the people. You've got to have good people, but they've got to have clear direction and they will, they will self-motivate then. Um, so anyway, that's my take on it. Ed, your experience out of the NRO, and uh, you know they were they were lean, they were innovative, and, and yet there were challenges too. So how would you uh, how would you advise the group today? Well, you know, I I I agree with what all these guys have said, but I guess I I'm optimistic. <laughs> Let me tell you why. 
<laughs> and I, I want to be optimistic. I would just encourage the Space Force, again, to get the best young officers they can and give them the best education from the best schools. So you need the brightest and the best. But also, I'm really confident that the new Space Force, for it to be preeminent in space and able to, to survive a conflict where uh, cybersecurity and whatever else is going to be present to try to take out our Space Force, I really am confident that that the new space force is is they may have to do it with super classification programs but they're going to wind up with the right programs and the right people and the right technologies to keep the us preeminent in space and just like we did it back in the cold war in the 70s and the 80s and and then we got overtaken by the digital revolution and it just revolutionized everything and, and put GPS in our little cell phones uh, in ways that we never could have dreamed of when we were all working long hours in the JPO between 74 and 80. Um, the same thing's going to happen again. Is that smart guys and good leadership are going to find a way to come up with the right technology and the right systems to keep us at the top. Well, I think fixing the requirement process is an extremely important one. I think uh, we've already emphasized one of my key points, which is uh, active steps to retain the best and brightest engineering officers, including early promotions, career monitoring. We used to have that. Where did we have it? We had it at something called Air Force Systems Command. Wait a minute, what was that? That was something that the great wisdom of the Air Force jammed in with the logistics and called it Materiel Command. And in the process, in my opinion, stripped away what Systems Command had been. And in part, the reason was that the operational Air Force didn't understand the development process. They thought it was you go buy paper clips or something like that. It isn't. As everyone, every one of you here, and, and Doug hasn't hit, said anything, I hope he's still listening, but the innovative- I'm, I'm, I'm listening and smiling, Brad, no question about it. <laughs> I'm glad you're there. Uh, look, the innovative development, it's more like combat than a by the book, no risk process. Once you get to the point, you know there, there's something good, you stamp out a few. But I contend these large block buys are driven by the wrong people for the wrong reasons. We should be able to come up with an innovation and within three to four years have that on orbit. NTS-3 is a great idea. It is horribly late. The idea has been floating around for at least 10 or 12 years and we still haven't got the thing up there, have we? And so I'm, I applaud the idea. I absolutely am appalled by the execution. And the trouble is the sense of urgency is not there and it really bothers me. So if I were king, I would somehow reestablish systems command. And uh, I, I know that everyone would say, oh, that's expensive, we wanna do it, la di da. I would lead it, I would have as leaders, development qualified general officers and it would include this delegated personnel function that monitored the career of people like Gaylord and people like Doug and ensured that those bright people, if they stayed in place for a long time, weren't being penalized. That if they got to stay there and see the, the fruits of their labor, the accountability that they had been given come to fruition somewhere, that those people would be rewarded, not penalized. And if they failed, they would not be penalized unless the failure was due to their own culpability. But I, again, I, so that's my passion speech. All right, if you'll, if you'll allow me to, to jump in uh, on, from Brad's point, because he's made some excellent points there. I just uh, want to make sure people understand. He talked about NTS. Ellen Palakowski and I approved uh, an NTS uh, development program back in 2012. It is now 2021. That's nine years for an experimental satellite meant to prove a, an objective, which is two and a half times longer than the original GPS satellite that took, like Brad likes to, uh, likes to tell us. Um, it just a, a awful. And his comment about 
uh, Air Force Systems Command couldn't be more on point. We lost something special. I'm very happy to see that the Space Force has a Space Systems Command. The question is, can they make it a special? This uh, look back in history of the founding and the uh, creation and birthing of uh, this global utility we have today. Well, I, I certainly agree uh, from my perspective of being in this for 50 years or more that uh, what Brad said is uh, appropriate. Uh, I guess I'm gonna uh, say that, you know, there's the, the technologies that are gonna be in the future about how uh, Moore's law keeps being uh, achieved. It's getting harder all the time. It's getting more complex, um, but you know, we're doing it. Um, and I just read an article recently about this uh, this um, process that has been developed for the next generation of uh, achieving Moore's law type of numbers uh, it, by a Dutch company. I think it's um, ASML. I'm not sure of that. I may have that mixed up. But anyhow, um, it, it's it's terribly complex. It's the most uh, complex machine ever built in order to produce ASICs chips of the future. And uh, it, it is uh, right now the Dutch company uh, in cooperation with a German company has agreed that they will not sell this to one of our adversaries. So, um, I think that kind of innovation, that kind of bringing new capabilities for AI, for quantum communications, for all of this stuff that we're going to need in the next generation or so um, to keep America preeminent in space. I think I'm, I'm confident we're going to get there. It's going to take a lot of hard work. Uh, but uh, I think, again, I'll, I'm kind of beating the horse on this, giving young officers the best education at the best universities, letting them get into technology, and then uh, letting them get into endeavors where they have responsibilities and uh, all the things about bringing stuff to first. I mean, the, the program that I was director of for a decade in the NRO we got from a program go ahead to first launch in three years. And uh, that's hard to do <laughs> in today's bureaucracy, but I think they'll always create special groups where they do special things and they do them fast and they do them well. Excellent, thank you, Ed. That I find really are going to be very important in the future are things like 3D printing, uh, I know there's one rocket company that is basically claiming they're going to build the entire rocket, at, at least 98, 99% of it uh, with 3D printing. That sort of thing could be done in space. You combine that with space robotics and uh, I see that sort of coming. I don't know how many years it will be, but it's coming. Um, the revolution in reusable launch vehicles is is certainly going to continue and uh, when you can put up uh, you know 80 satellites at a time uh, that changes the whole equation and that's happening as we speak um, which brings me to my last point and that is we better start taking the issue of space debris really seriously uh, if we don't, it's going to kill us. There won't be any space program for anybody. Uh, we've got to do something about it. And the quicker we can put stuff up, the faster the problem grows. And uh, I'm a big believer in uh, the Kessler syndrome. It's going to happen. I don't know when, but it's going to happen. And once it starts, it's too damn late. I, I end up particularly struck by the differences between GPS as an agile, urgent program, the gunship that I was on as an agile, urgent program, 
and the way we do things today. And I think in part, it's a belabored approval process that could be fixed. In part, it's in the old days, if you go all the way back to the history of the Air Force, it was build a little, test a little, build a little, test a little. And those cycles, particularly towards the end of World War II, were very rapid. And I think the F-104 is another example of a skunk works, build a little, test a little. Um, as I remember, it was assembled, the first model, in, in like a year, a year and a half. It was some, but how did they do it? They used things that were already existing. They didn't hesitate to do that. And particularly on GPS and the user equipment area, I think the user equipment people are largely ignoring the Qualcomm chips that now not only have dual frequency in all constellations, they can do carrier tracking and get potential accuracies at the centimeter level. This is at a $2 chip. Nothing like that, to my knowledge, has been incorporated into the um, military user equipment. So I, I would like to see a PNT guru for the Air Force or Space Force. We do not have one. The, the Navy has one. As I understand it, the Army has one. We do not have one with budget authority. And I would like to see a process of build a little, test a little, and try to get around this requirements morass. And in, in so doing, have greater agility. Get to the answer quicker. Use the bright officers you all talked about. But you talk about powerful motivations. I would not have stayed in the Air Force were it not for the wonderful things that I, they let me do. Gaylord, as a young captain and major, had enormous authority. And he didn't have to go to a lot of people. I, in, in some cases, he actually went to me for a decision, which wasn't very often, if you can listen to him very carefully. But that was OK, because I had delegated it to him, and I trusted him to make good decisions. And if they were heavy hit, hitting, he would come and see me. But the point is, that's motivational. And delegating responsibilities down with authority, very motivational. And I think, uh, among other things, that's the key. So uh, thanks a lot, Larry, for doing an excellent job of putting us all together. And I have to say, none of you look a day older than you did when I saw you last time. Uh, <laughs> that, that attacks the credibility of everything I said, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> No, listen, it, it's really great to see, uh, see you, and it, it's very sad to think of all of our colleagues who one can no longer see. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks to all, and a, a great day.